Well, hello and welcome to this the latest edition of our daily uh, virtual catch up over coffee with Crypto AM, where we get people dialing in from the UK and overseas talking about COVID 19, the impact, what the government's doing, what the responses of citizens and organizations is, um, and how things are generally going on. So, no structure, no format, no idea who's going to show up today. Um, let's take it from there. That's, that's, oh, yeah. that's, that's pretty awesome there. Yeah. Anyway, have you been? What are you up to? Yeah, so um, just prepping for a webinar I'm giving later on this week, actually, um, to a bunch of people in Sri Lanka. We're going to be talking yeah. about blockchain and cryptocurrency and the impact of COVID-19. It's been really fascinating, actually, talking to them, mm. uh, the, the organizers out there, because I'm saying, well, I know that they've got some infections of COVID-19. How's it going? And he's saying, oh, yeah, you know, we've got, I think, some like 200 cases and 10 people died and this kind of thing. He said, you know, what's it like in the UK? And I said, well, we've got about 15,000 people died so far and, you know, 500 a day dying, this kind of thing. And he was just blown away. He, he didn't realize the scale of it. So, yeah, so pre prepping for d doing a webinar on, on that. And, now, is it your paid business? Because I've not really asked you about mm -hmm. your paid business. Yeah, so, so um, I'm a blockchain educator, advisor, consultant. So I, I do a little bit of AI, machine learning, a little bit of data analytics as well. But mainly, it's about when I first came into the space, I actually set up my company. My background is data and analytics. I want to talk an interest in blockchain and distributed ledger. So distributed ledger and analytics. Oh, that, that's a niche area. So that's why my company is called Distalytics, which sounded good at the time. It was a Google whack. I sounded really <coughs> clever. And then I realized afterwards, everyone can't pronounce it, can't type it, and think it's a distillery in some way. But the, the idea was I was going to set myself up as a consultancy doing distributed ledger analytics. And then when I started speaking to prospective clients, and I said, oh, how are, you, how are you going to do analytics on the blockchain? Bear, bear in mind, this was 2016 at the time. And I usually got this rabbit in the headlamps look back at me and say, analytics on the blockchain. Hmm. What's a blockchain? And that's at the point you realize you're a little bit ahead of yourself. So I kind of realized that before I can get people who want my skills in analytics on the blockchain, I'm going to have to teach them about blockchain. So I set up consultancy practice through education and training, that kind of stuff. Uh, did a few contracts with the likes of Lloyds of London, uh, running blockchain projects, um, actually doing proof of concepts and pilots, exploring different blockchain technologies like um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, and a, f a few others working with some of the consultancies as well. Um, and now I spend my time educating boards, individuals, whoever will pay me, um, when they want to learn about blockchain. That's why I, I describe myself as a blockchain luminary. So mm. I don't claim to be an expert, but I do claim to be able to cast quite a bright light onto quite a dark area. Because the number of times, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it yourself, when you get people trying to describe what a blockchain is, and mm. it just gets so either overly technical or complicated or whatever, whereas I tend to make it somewhat simpler and <coughs> and how it can be used in businesses and that kind of thing so so that, yeah that, that's uh, most of the stuff i do do you go into individual protocols at all um only to a very limited extent i tend to do a comparison between the main ones so you know bitcoin being a primarily a cryptocurrency ethereum being primarily uh, programmability waves being for game playing zcash and monero being for privacy coins but i don't actually go into it much beyond that kind of level um, but do explain things like proof of work and proof of stake. But uh, as I say to people, the thing that got me really interested in blockchain was when you realize it's a protocol. And the great thing about protocols, well, there's two great things. One is that they are really, really boring, which is a technology guy I, I like because it means no one else takes any interest in them. Um, and the second is that they're game changing. You look at um, HTTP, and TCPIP, which you know, you and I both know what they are. But for most people, they, they've probably never even heard of them. They might have seen HTTP in the web browser, but they don't know how it works or anything. And the great thing about protocol is you don't need to know how it works. Just like Bluetooth or SMTP, you just get on with using these things. And that's the same with blockchain. So I, I tend, 
I tend not to go into it in too much detail no, no, no. beyond saying I'm going to teach you enough that you don't need to remember it. You just need to be aware of it. Got it. Okay. It's interesting. Um, gosh, you remind me, I used to, many years ago, I used to be able to tell you what the seven layers of the OSI state. Yep. <laughs> and I could argue why UDP was good for some things and not for other things. I still think it's amazing UDP. But anyway, moving on. Um, the thing that, uh, it's interesting, the thing that got me engaged with blockchain was uh, when in level 39, we set up one of the first blockchain labs. And that was pretty cool. That was good fun. And what we were doing there, oh, I see Fernando's joined. Hey. Hey, Eric. Hey. Hey, Fernando. Hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. Hey, hey how's it going? Yeah, all good. Yeah. We're, we're just hey, talking, about, we're talking about the history uh, of blockchain at the moment, or rather our Eric's history of it. How, how we all got into it. And uh, so it was setting up the blockchain lab, one of the first ones in uh, in the UK, in level 39. Not, not very first, but one of the first in 2013. Actually, it's funny, I met the other day a guy who came to my first blockchain event in uh, level 39 in 2013. That was a crazy event. There was absolutely bonkers. But, I'll never, I'll never, but it was also life-changing for me. Uh, but the lab was fantastic because what we did, we set up a um, a very neutral lab which did testing of different protocols as people emerged them. And we've set up this thing. There was a technology team that videoed all the tests that we did and made sure it was through you know proper pr uh, process um, of. It was actually a methodology. We'd set it up according to the specifications of the, each of the providers, but then we had this nine principles of transaction as expressed it by 42 hypothesis that they went through for each one. So it was our own benchmarking, uh, which we did. We, we did this for a client initially who paid us. And so we couldn't publish the details, but we loved doing it so much we carried on afterwards. But I, I th you know, it was that and that exposure. And then of course, working with Active Ledger where as a result of that, we saw what the disadvantages of the various protocols were. And so it's nice to have been through, through the full life cycle of building a complete ground up protocol, which is Active Ledger. So actually at some point worth looking at that, I'd love you to take a peek at that because it's uh, just starting to get some traction. Very interestingly with Active Ledger, it is fully bilingual, uh, Mandarin and English. Okay. And well, so we've got about 200 developers a week downloading it in China, which is quite interesting. Uh, of the yeah, languages you like right. bilingual in, uh, English and Chinese are probably the two best ones right now, aren't they? Probably, yeah. It's, it's a bit contentious with China at the moment. And we can always rely on Fernando to help us understand how contentious. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could. I love, honestly, I love seeing some of the things that you write, Fernando. I keep asking myself, you are not a normal person. You have not had a normal <laughs> Thank you. The things you know about, it is impossible to know without being involved in some pretty interesting activities, either for governments or for something like that. I, or, say, or I, say, no, I say nothing. <laughs> I reckon so. I reckon so. You know, there are, you know, Eric, you know me and you know that I spoke with you about certain things. There are, you did, you there, are, there, are there are things I can't talk about. And no, like especially as, as this well. is a recorded session that will be played again afterwards. <laughs> no, no. When I talk here, I can talk. You know, it's not a problem at all. You know, but you know what I mean. I mean, you you were yeah, involved no. with government, Gary, as well, and you know, guys know how it is. You know, yeah. it's one of those things. A while ago, I was doing a training session uh, in St Catherine's Dock, in fact, with a, a training organisation, and I was talking about the various industries I'd worked in, and it's, I find it great because I've worked in retail, pharmaceuticals, commodities, insurance, and a few others. And it's funny that any time any of the class participants was asking a question, I was able to talk to them in the language of their industry because I'd, I'd worked in that industry. And they ended up turning around. <laughs> one, of the guy, one of the guys turned around and he said, is there any sector you've not worked in? And I thought about it for a while. <laughs> and I eventually realized that the, the, the were two. And one was telecoms, um, which, which is interesting. Eventually I'll do that one day. And then this guy turned around and said, hmm, ever work for any interesting government agencies? I said, well, if I had, I wouldn't be able to tell you. 
And so you can take it from the fact that I'm not telling you that I may have or I may not have. And <laughs> I, I got, I got a, a, um, a delivery, so excuse me for a few minutes, okay? Uh, no worries. <laughs> Speaking of telecoms, um, Haskell, you know, the, the programming language of Haskell um, is, of course, pretty robust. And it's, uh, it, it's, you know, I, I remember it from telecoms uh, as being, you know, the, the, the robust language of choice for high velocity resilience, multiple connections and all that kind of stuff. And so it's interesting when you see projects like Cardano being built using tools like Haskell, which is, is you know, it's very robust. And, uh, and if they talk about the sort of throughput. And so have you, is there anybody looking at the tools that are people are using to build the various protocols? I don't know. I mean, funnily enough, of all the people, Charles Hoskinson's probably the one to have a conversation with around that. Um, not not just because of his knowledge of uh, and his involvement in Cardano, but because prior to that, when he was working, was he one of the Bitcoin core team or something? It was or, Ethereum. Yeah, Ethereum. Sorry. Yeah, again. Um, I, I think they were they were looking at those kind of things because I know again when you look at um, R three and the quarter protocol, mm. and you, you look at uh, Richard Gendel Brown and the stuff that he looked at, I think that's how they yeah. took, took a step back again and looked at what was the most suitable development language to develop things in, which is where I think they ended mm. up with, um, was it Golan or something, or Go, or something similar. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's almost one of those things you'd expect a university to do an academic piece on, of mm. like a, a cross comparison of um, la languages or um, development tools or whatever. I, I'm not I'm not aware of anything though directly. So I I tend to steer quite clear away from such a foundational level. So I, when I'm speaking to people, I'm looking more in terms of the application of the technology, not mm. in the protocol layer or e even below that. Uh, yeah, the application, especially as those are your customers, and yep. then speaking to them about the benefits and the use cases. Is probably but it, ex exactly, and it, it all comes down to, you know, ultimately any language or protocol or whatever, it's all about moving ones and zeros. It, it's, mm. just, it's just where it moves them and how it moves them. And it comes back to what's the business benefit of moving the numbers around and that. So now uh, I've... I've been away from the foundational level. I mean, I, I used to do years and years ago assembler programming and think of six five zero two microprocessors and that. So I used Ooh. to get I used to get seriously deep and heavy on the tech, but I've stepped <laughs> away from that a long while ago now. Although I, I believe there is a resurgence in the need for COBOL developers in the states at the moment. So Honestly, I'm, I'm, yeah, so no. yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, so I'm, 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 I might have to dig, dig out my COBOL 74 training notes or something. Oh, amazing, yeah. Well, when you think about it, quite a few um, European banks' core systems are running on COBOL, you know, and they don't touch them because they work, yep. they, you know. Um, but, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's tricky, the talent around that. But, yeah, no, I still think it's... I, when I used to work for Kantar, I, uh, I had a team of guys there were about 14 people that were responsible for one of the COBOL <laughs> applications, which believe it or not, it still is the application today that um, uh, pushes out TV audience is in UK. So Kantar is still responsible for crunching up the numbers. So Barb they still gave them the contract. So they get all the data uh, from TV viewing habits, and that's the data that is crunched up to provide then to advertisers and everyone else in the industry. <laughs> Cobol. So this, this is where it, it takes me back to the um, year 2000 problem, when uh, originally I, I was involved in a lot of the remediation work for a company looking at year 2000 bugs and everything, and everyone now says, oh, COVID, it's a bit like year 2000 bug, people are making a big deal of it, but nothing actually happened. But when you look Ooh. at the life of, sorry, um, I was saying, when you look back at how old some of these computer programs are now, 
as you say, you know, written in COBOL from centuries ago, it, it's kind of like going back to the year 2000 again of discovering what's still around. As a, hey guys, what, what do you guys think about these new government schemes for startups? Because I, I, I tell you right now my opinion. I mean, it looks like it's 1,200 startups with 125,000, 150, I can't remember, grant. 1,200 startups. And last year, 1,500 and something startups were created per day. 650,000 startups only last year. It's just insane. A lot of this innovation, people that put, I'm one of those, you know, uh, put all their life savings. Some, I know people who mortgage their house, put all the money on the idea, which was what the government has been preaching for the last 10 years. Yeah, let's innovate. Is It's one of the things, uh, part of their strategy for Brexit was to be a, a tech hub, you know, and all of this innovation is going to be bought by Chinese by Mubadala with the Saudis, they're already gearing up and coming to, to, to the UK and other countries to just to buy the tech and the IP and that's it, or bring them to those countries as well. I find it quite amazing that they don't understand, that, you know, they should print like 50 billion and just distribute across all startups, you know? That's what, do what, you I think think. The, what do you think the overall economic impact of something like that would be, Fernando? Of, well, for going forward, tremendously, but you know, I don't think they are interested in that. They're interested at the moment just to be looking nice to Midlands and north of England, basically, you know? <laughs> That's what it's looking like, you know? Well, it's something if you compare the numbers, you look at um, HS2, which has always been a bit of a bugbear of mine, of uh, the most massive unwanted project ever, and that the costs of that are going to be somewhere, best estimate, 50 billion realistic estimate 100, 100 billion well actually what could you do with 50 billion of investments in small startups because everyone knows that st small startups generate more employment because many of them grow rapidly they scale they grow they develop on that compared to if you paid 50 billion to your existing infrastructure suppliers you know your land shifters and this kind of thing so i i, I agree fernando i think the the announcement that the government made a couple of days ago, it was just soundbite material. You know, we're supporting startups, we're trying to innovate, blah, blah, blah. When you look at the terms and conditions, were for a lot of them, you needed to already have uh, capital investments of a quarter of a million, I think, for some of the projects and 125K for others. That puts it beyond the reach of many of the microscale businesses that are going to grow into small businesses and so on. So, yeah, if, if you put a massive cash injection in, of instead of doing HS2, that was going to benefit the Hitachis and the whatevers of the world and give it as um, grant aid to hundreds of thousands of small businesses. I think I think that would have an amazing uh, an effect. I'm not entirely sure that it's a like for like comparison, but but I, I, I'll let it go because of the size of the investment making an impact on the startup community. So if you said, if you were sitting in treasury and you're going to put a big chunk of money to work in the economy, to drive the economy, to drive job creation, economic growth, et cetera, um, you, you, you're, you're right. The comparison is what would you do in each respective type of project? But it is certainly not a, a comparison you, you really can make. And then to go back to Fernando's question, what do we really think about it? Um, well, the loan guarantee scheme, I'll be quite honest, was uh, not fully, not as comprehensive as it could be. And it's a very difficult community that you're asking to carry the burden of what you know today will be a very high failure rate across those loans. Okay, and so why, after complaining so profusely to the banks about so how badly they operated, are we saying to you guys, go go for it, banks, lend the money, and yeah, take 20% of the hit? And well, they're not going to, which is why so few loans were issued because there wasn't a 100% guarantee. For it to work, they would have needed to provide a 100% government guarantee because then there would be no liability. And if they get it wrong, we'll blame the banks, right? They say, well, no, you should have done better credit checks, you should have taken you know, guarantees. 
Uh, so so that, that hasn't quite been as well thought through as possible, and I see a lot of pressure to increase that to 100%. They are, they are playing politics, Eric, you see, and, and the, all the usual stuff they do is just, you know, marketing type of yeah. strategies, and we know why. You know who is the marketologist that is there advising <laughs> the PM? So everything is around that, but the reality is that people will end up having no jobs, yeah. And they will lose their own uh, livelihood, is, and, and right. they will impact because people will never forget this. Yeah. You know? it, 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 yeah, there's no question that this is so unwelcome and that there will be a lot of casualties. Now, when you look then at the other schemes, I mean, Fernando, you and I have had offline chats. Let me ask you, yeah. so bearing in mind, this is recorded and can be seen, right? You can click and record this afterwards. So... But I know that you're very open and direct anyway. So have you been able to take advantage of any of the government schemes, Fernando? Not yet, of course, you know. Uh, I'm okay. thinking how am I going to apply because I'm, not, I'm never the first one to go. I let people go and I see what's happened, you know. Yeah. I'm one of those, yeah. Well, let me just give you some feedback. Then some of my companies, some of the portfolio, have used the furlough scheme. And so on the calls when I join them as, you know, chairman, um, I make sure they understand to do it legally correctly because I'm absolutely sure this will be audited later. And so I'm saying make sure that you keep on the payroll, even if you're reducing what they're doing, who is necessary to deliver your obligations, especially where you've taken money from clients to deliver. You have to have people to deliver that. The rest you can furlough. Um, and it's very good that they've now said that company directors can continue to make sure that their companies are remain in good standing, even though they can furlough themselves, which is quite an interesting thing. So they're allowed to conduct their legal responsibilities. So, so I think the furlough scheme, short-lived, is a way of just clinging on to some of those people and talent. Because think about it, right? Even if you're furloughed, you can spend your time learning, you spend your time reading. If it was, you know, some of the teams are using this as a time to do self-learning, self-improving, given the time that they would never normally have with pressures of deadlines, right? So trying to use that to the advantage, I, I quite like the furlough scheme. But then when I looked at the, lo the, um, the matching um, convertible loan note, where the qualifying amount is 250,000 of investment that you have had to have already. So what's happened there is that someone has done some mathematics and calculated and figured out, I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm guessing this, because I don't actually know, not having been part of the conversations, but um, I'm guessing that someone's done some calculations and said, look, the level of risk, the failure rate of companies that haven't raised anything, have raised a small amount of friends and family, 50, 100K, the failure rate is incredibly high. Your point at which they become more viable is 250K. So what you're seeing is a kind of Darwinian, Darwinian selection process where, actually Darwinian is not the right comparison because it isn't natural selection, it's an unnatural selection taking place of a way of saying which companies can we put money into that are less likely to fail because remember this is our money this is taxpayers money right well eric isn't that it's like the old saying that banks will only lend people money when the people don't need it and that's not probably really. and, but that, not, that, not, that's what it kind of feels like that with that eligibility yes, it, criteria. It, feels like, it feels like that but think it through what you want is a, a cadre of startups that survived, that are most likely to be the most rapid job creators mm. in a post-COVID world. You okay, don't I agree. I agree with that, and I agree that they should support those really well. But here's a stat for you: 86.7 percent of the startups that were created in 2017 are still alive. So we live in a new world. So I think what they are being advised That's is amazing. By, yeah, it is amazing. You know, uh, you, you can look good at it online. Uh, Fernando, I really would love that. Thank yeah. You. yeah. And um, the, what happens then is that the, the advice they are getting is from the usual VCs. 
And yeah, you know how it is. VCs at the moment, they don't live in the real world, you know? <laughs> they just don't. You know, a lot of the people looking for money from VCs, they tell that. They just do not, because most of them employ ex-bankers from the 2008 crash. Yeah, and they have, that's the ones who are vetting everything at the top VCs. So I don't think the government has been really well advised because they didn't look at the, the survival rate of startups at the moment, which is amazing. It's quite high. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, I, I think at the moment, Someone has joined us. <laughs> hey, Alex, good afternoon to you. You, you've, you timed it just as we're wrapping this meeting up, in fact, because we're just on the 30 minute mark. Can you hear us? <laughs> it's, it's a great discussion. Let's put it on the agenda for the next one that we will yeah. join. Or maybe a separate one because. Time well, let's, talk tomorrow, let's talk tomorrow about this in further detail, if you guys don't mind. Yeah, yeah sure. Could you get of your, you know what Gary's like, he's going to ask you the source of your 87.3%. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> that, that. That'd be excellent. Okay. Look, guys, yeah, really sorry on this. Um, I, I do try to limit this just 30 minutes because sometimes as a risk, you do start drifting off and everything. What I will do, though, for those who couldn't join us, is that I will edit some interesting stuff because that, that was an interesting discussion and I agree completely with Eric and Fernando. It'd be good to carry on that conversation, mm. maybe tomorrow or whatever. So what I'll do, I'll, I'll edit out the, the early bits and we'll, we'll include that cool stuff and I'll, I'll splash that out via YouTube later. So mm. what, what we'll do, we'll close off the session for today. Let's get back tomorrow. We can go through that again. I try and avoid agendas usually for these meetings, but that, that would be a really fascinating thing to have as a, a, a primary discussion point. Maybe that'll bring yeah, more, you may more people will join actually if uh, if we just suggest that we'll put that what do people think of and any any what would might be useful is ask people to share any experiences they've had with any of the schemes yeah that, that'd be good and it's funny as well because i also run a whatsapp group which is for small sole business self-employed people um because mm -hmm. we're all in the similar boat self-employed directors can't furlough ourselves because we still have to go out sales prospecting and that kind of thing um, so yeah, that, that'll be great. Okay, guys, gonna have to close off now. So as I always sign off, I always say, uh, now wash your hands and have a good day and hopefully see some, if not all of you tomorrow. Uh, have a good day. Stay safe. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 So another great conversation. Unfortunately, I had to bring that to a close, but uh, same time, same place tomorrow. Running these every weekday at 2 p.m. UK time. Uh, 2 till 2.30, nice, sharp, short, punchy, uh, do come and join us.